Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here to share some thoughts with you. And I want to start just by saying I'm often puzzled at some things around the world and how they work. One of the things that is more trivial that puzzles me is why is it that the knots I tie always come untied, whether it's for a fishing line or whether it's for a boat or whether it's for my shoes. And yet when I want knots to not show up as in a garden hose, they always have multiple knots in them. It's just fascinating. But the one that I think that really strikes me in a positive, profound way is why is it when we go in an airline ride in coach that we can end up having a conversation with somebody that we've never met that is more intimate and more vulnerable than somebody we've known for years? What is it about that seatmate at 30,000 feet that causes us to allow our authentic, shelf, our authentic self to show up and maybe to have the kinds of conversations we haven't had with a spouse for 15 years, with somebody that works for us for 10, or somebody that we work for for five. I've been so intrigued by that that I've even thought about the possibility of putting a set of airline seats in our lobby. You know, and, and on the middle of it said, captivating conversations from coach. Because it really strikes me that it's different. Something is going on there that creates authenticity. When I think of it, it also happens occasionally for me at a campfire where neighbors and friends come together and we have this conversation that's different. And I know it's not all alcohol-induced. It is just this effortless attempt to be with people and almost human to human have a conversation that is authentic. Now we begin to understand what really is happening. Neuroscience is telling us and research scientists have shown us why this matters. And what they have come up with is a very profound, simple fact. And that is, when power goes to your head, it may shut down your heart. What we know is that when power begins to go to your head, it diminishes and debilitates all of our abilities to be empathetic in all the varieties possible. Power to our head actually changes the way our brain works. It's called the mirror system of the brain and it alters actually the way we think and behave. And the most difficult thing is that it makes it very difficult for us, very hard for us, to feel and understand what other people feel and understand. As a matter of fact, here's the kicker. And the kicker is the more powerful you become, you could even say the more successful you become, or more accomplished you become, the less authentic you become as a leader, which is a very important thought. And you know what? This Justin isn't an affliction that affects CEOs, where he or she allows the power disease to somehow erode their authenticity. The mere system of the brain reacts to things like direct reports where you have a few more, or it could react to a new promotion. Or it could react to additional desk space. It could react to a raise. It actually could react to your 15 minutes of fame. Or just because you're the boss. This can show up and begin to erode your authenticity. Now, you've heard before that power corrupts. What you may not have heard is that it also separates us from the connections that allow us to be human. One of the things that you have to ask is what is it about that airline coach seat? What is the mystique about that coach seat and the magic about the seatmate's conversation that really makes it unique? What is going on there? And what you begin to find out, it is a universal experience of shared public vulnerability. At 30,000 feet, we have the same amount of feet space. We have the same turbulence. We have the same peanuts. We have the same plastic cup of water or bottle of water. And we have that same dreaded shared armrest. We're all equal, absolutely equal. And so when you think about it, one way to think about authenticity is to think about what is inauthentic. So what builds in authenticity is status, rank, authority, possessions. What builds authenticity is compassion, empathy, vulnerability, and service. 
the boldest, authentic thing you can do as a leader is to be vulnerable. And when you think of that, the inauthentic power that we often get actually creates a differential between ourselves and other people. It creates this differential that can best be described by, I have more than you. I know more than you. I am more than you. The authentic power, which is built on compassion, which is built on empathy, which is built on vulnerability and service, is very different. Now, the challenge we face is that in most cases, our inauthentic power shows up more in our organizations than anything else. As a matter of fact, spurred by our ego, that power shows up to the point where we rarely tell each other the truth in any of our organizations. As a matter of fact, truth-telling is not a core competency. I've had a chance to work with over 400 organizations around the world. I haven't found one where that exists naturally. As a matter of fact, there are only three places we tell the truth in our organizations. I'll give you a second to think about it. They're the hallway, the water cooler, and the bathroom. And I want to test this with you to see if how true it may be. And I'm going to pre-warn you that if you laugh, you will give yourself away. Okay? How many of you have been to a meeting, clearly not a TEDx meeting, and clearly not an IBM meeting, your previous company, where you went to that meeting and you went to the restroom after the meeting with somebody that you trusted, and as you went into the restroom, before you opened your mouth, you did one of these things. And some of you are laughing because you did. And what did you do? You checked to see if anybody else was there before you said what you really thought, what you said, what you really felt. And the fact of the matter is it is, is fundamentally not safe to create an, an environment for us to say what we think and what we really feel. So there is a way to change that. And there is a way to challenge that. The good news is that you can be coached back to your compassion itself. And you can be coached back to that place where the authentic leadership shows up and the authentic leadership tells the truth and the authentic leadership understands deeply what people think and feel. And the place to take the cue is from comedians. One of the favorite that I have is Bill Cosby. Now Bill Cosby has an amazing skill as many other comedians. He or she can be in this room with three times as many people, 5,000 people, with nothing but a chair, no slides, no PowerPoints, no visuals. And within 10 minutes, create an emotional connection with the audience that many leaders can't create in 10 years. And you have to say, what are they doing? How are they doing that? And what exactly is happening? Bill Cosby does a routine that I remember fondly as a child. And it's a little bit older for those of us that are baby boomers, it'll make sense. For those of you that are younger, I'll explain it. But Bill Cosby does a routine where he pretends he's in the dentist chair. And the dentist says, rinse. Now, what you don't know is this occurred before the suction devices would suck the saliva out of our throat as the dentist as we go to now. And literally, what would happen is because when the dentist said rinse, your lip was numb and your tongue was numb, you would go to swirl and spit but you couldn't get the drool off your lip. You just, it was hanging there and you would swat it this way and swat it that way. And for everyone that had that experience, they emotionally stand up in the audience and say, he knows what it's like to be me. And now that he's met me on my terms, I will go anywhere. The emotional connection of comedy is a profound concept of authentic leadership. And it is that the comedian is able to convey to those that they lead, those that they entertain, those that will follow, that they understand the audience's predicament before they have to tell them. And C Cosby was phen phenomenal at that. There is another comedian who is a great truth teller. As a matter of fact, this comedian is in 1900 newspapers around the world, somehow has captured relevance and resonance with the people all over the world, and what he creates ends up in many of the cubicles of the people that we work with, work for, and, and are in teams with. And his name is Dilbert. Absolutely. What does Dilbert do? Dilbert draws cartoons about how people think and how people feel. 
And those cartoons capture the imagination and the emotional connection with people so much so that they put them up. That they, 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 they put them in PowerPoint presentations. They put them in, in conversations. They talk about them in different ways. Now, what Dilbert has taught us is that if we find a way to make tangible what people feel in a visual, to see what people feel and to validate those feelings, then it has a magnetic capability. It draws people to it. And you know what? We've known this for years. We've known it for years because we've seen our children do this. How many of you have ever talked to your children for a number of times? But when they drew those feelings in a picture, it had a totally different impact. My mom drinks too much wine. My dad is a super dad. It's different. It conveys the content of that emotion and feeling and has an impact that is undeniable. Now, the excitement about this is that you can actually draw yourself to be coached back into coach and create a level relating field where the talents of Dilbert and the talents of Cosby create an authentic leader in a unique way, in a way that really does make an impact and in a way that can transform an organization, a team, and an individual. What I'd like to do is just share with you a story of that. It's called the art of the water cooler. And it's using all of those techniques to connect people in a sense of shared public vulnerability. The story goes something like this. We were working with an organization that was a $12 billion company. This $12 billion company had 63,000 people. And those 63,000 people were borrowed of an organization that was creating a brand new strategy. So we worked with the leaders for six months on that brand new strategy. We went to an organization, actually we went to a hotel on the other side of the state and brought the top 250 leaders to that hotel for three days to engage in that strategy, to talk about that strategy, to really be owned and buy into that strategy. And at 11 o'clock, just before we decided to send everybody home, we gave everybody these audience response systems that were anonymous, and we said to them, how confident are of you this strategy? Actually, the actual question we asked, how many of you would advise your mom and dad, aunt and uncle, niece and nephew, to buy our stock based on our new strategy? They all clicked. The number came up on the screen. Guess what the number was? 19%. 19%. The chairman looked over to me and said, you guys are really good. How do I get all my money back? I said, let's hang on for a second. Because he profoundly understood that if 19% of their top leaders had a vote of confidence, this, there was no way it was going to work. We went out and talked to those 250 people. And they said resoundingly, the strategy is not the problem. It's our fundamental disbelief that our leaders will change their behaviors to bring it to life. And we drew a picture. The picture looks something like this. All the leaders were wearing masks, not saying what they really thought at this leadership table. Some of the leaders, as you can see, we're in the center and they had a shield that said, I met my number, so you, I, you can't touch me. As a matter of fact, this doesn't apply to me. Others were talking about the fact that they were drinking non-confrontational waters and the real issues weren't being addressed. Some of the leaders felt that they were still at the kids' table at Thanksgiving. They never had a chance to go to the adult grown-up table to really be part of the conversation. On the far left, you can see that many of them felt that if you really wanted to do anything, you slipped a note in the inbox of the CEO, and that's where business was conducted. Some of them felt that the strategy was almost handicapped, and it was new every six months. These were the issues that represented the vote of 19%. The most fascinating thing that happened is we showed the 250 leaders this picture. And they said, first and foremost, we can't believe you were in the bathroom and heard what we really had to say. The second thing they said was, 
we can't believe you had the courage to show us what we really believe, what we think, and what we feel. The third thing they said is, if you're serious about this, so are we. Let's embrace this together. We won't go to 30,000 feet in a coach seat, but we clearly, let's be vulnerable together and talk about this. They actually, as you can see here, began to check the issues that were the most greatest inhibitors. They talked about the things that were really um, not, not allowing them to go forward. And they even asked and talked to each other about how have you contributed to this? How have you benefited from this? And how have or how will we be successful if we don't address this? The most fascinating part of the, about the story is that <clears throat> the stock was at 26. Shortly after the session and shortly after the, we went through the process of shared public vulnerability on the real issues in the bathroom, not the intellectual issues on the strategy deck, the stock went from 26 to 126 and split twice. And the chairman will tell you it was not the strategy that made the difference. It was the authenticity with which we were willing to be publicly vulnerable and share that vulnerability and be truth tellers to each other that made it all change. What I believe is it not only becomes the emphasis of the team, but everybody's watching. One of the individuals that reported to someone on that team said, when I see our leaders passionate about the truth and humble enough to let their egos go to really find it, it fires me up to do the same. So the opportunity, I think, is to create a level relating field, one that happens in a few places of our life, but clearly not at work. And a level relating field that allows us to take that sense of shared public vulnerability from 30,000 feet on that rare occasion when we might have an unbelievably intimate conversation with someone we've never met and beam it down to a room like this where you may not be sharing an armrest but we're pretty close in terms of sharing the space with each other and find a way to really authentically as a TEDxer with passion and curiosity and vulnerability. Explore the true perspective of what our people think and feel and begin to see our leadership through the eyes of the people we serve and see what can happen. My only suggestion, just bring your own peanuts. Thank you.